bring back treason charges, start cancelling citizenships, stop apologizing for your political and technological superiority, start dealing with this internal threat the same way you deal with Putin's external threat, start legislating and implementing these new laws or else the real far right will control the narrative and will take these steps that I've just mentioned. When I was a kid growing up in Pakistan, I saw many Pakistani intellectuals who tried to educate their own people. They used to say that the West is not responsible for our failures. It's not the West's fault that our countries are corrupt, that we don't know how to build bridges or that we don't know how to manufacture cars and other high-tech products. Yes, we were colonized, but that was 75 years ago. We've had plenty of time to build our own countries. And most importantly, let's say the West conspires against us. Then shame on us for continuing to fall for their conspiracies while we cannot conspire against them. These are some of the thoughts of a famous Pakistani intellectual Hassan Nassar. It seems Pakistani people didn't take any of his advice except the last one I just mentioned. Yes, we didn't get better in science and technology or improve our human rights records or establish strong political systems or strengthen our democratic institutions. No, we didn't improve on anything. But we did listen to his advice about conspiring against the West in response to their supposed conspiracies. It was a long project spanning multiple generations or at least 30 to 40 years. We sent hundreds of thousands of immigrants to the West. Those immigrants were initially thankful for the new lives they were given by the West. They raised their families there, who benefited from Western facilities even more than their parents. They became doctors, engineers and entrepreneurs and became just like the white man. But not quite. They left their third world countries behind, but their third world mentality and hatred for the West didn't leave them. The West unknowingly or lazily engineered its demography and consequently its own doom. This social experiment in demographic engineering had never been done on such a scale before. Initially in the 80s and 90s, immigrant intake was very careful and on such a small scale that its adverse effects were not and could not be noticed. Yes, we had a few Muslim doctors and some cheap laborers, but nothing significant. And as I said earlier, the first generation of immigrants was somewhat grateful. They didn't know the language of their newly adopted countries, or at least not as good as the natives. They faced hardship and even racism to some extent, but they battled through it. The white people were also changing at the same time. They were leaving behind their racial superiority complex and starting to embrace people from other cultures. Things were going in the right direction. And let me tell you, there are many success stories of people coming from other cultures and fully integrating into Western society. You can see many second or third generation Chinese, Vietnamese or Indians who are not divided over their loyalties. To the best of my knowledge, there are no parallel Chinese or Indian societies running in the UK or America. We only have the good, harmless elements of their cultures, such as Chinese New Year or Diwali. There are no demands for special Chinese courts or Hindu courts. But yes, I'm getting to the elephant in the room. There is a parallel system in the West, and that is the Islamic system. Although the first generation didn't cause much trouble, the same cannot be said about the second and third generations. Despite taking full advantage of what the West had to offer, they still believe their loyalties lie with their religion and the home countries of their parents. Let me show you an example, and of course, there are literally tens of thousands of such examples. Check out this Pakistani academic, born and raised in Canada, whose parents didn't see anything wrong with moving to a country that was founded as a colony, usurping the rights of the indigenous population. They didn't see anything wrong with it because at that time, those shiny roads with excellent infrastructure and near-perfect health and education facilities looked much better than sanctimonious ideals like down with colonialism. Okay, they could say, hey, we didn't choose to be born in a colonial country. Sure, none of us picked the countries we're born in, but we do choose the countries we live in. She could have easily moved to any country she saw fit, thanks to the power of the passports of these colonial countries. By the way, what does she mean by decolonial scholar activist? <laughs> I mean, such kind of stupid faux subjects actually exist in Western academia today. Well, 
I only have one advice for her. Charity begins at home. But I'm sure they'll have some convenient excuse for continuing to live in these wonderful Western countries. Such as, we'll leave once we have decolonized these colonial countries. Let's have a look at one of her viral yet hypocritical posts. You know what the colonizers didn't count on? Those of us born and raised in the West, in the mothership of the colony, turning on them. Yes, you're right. They didn't factor in ungrateful, treacherous pricks like you. They thought that once they embraced you, fed you, housed you, and gave you first world amenities, you would at least be loyal to the state that has given you so much. What exactly are you turning against? The very liberties that allow you to voice the dissent? The institutions that protect your right to criticize without fear of retribution? If anything, the fact that you can critique these structures so openly proves their resilience and value. They thought we'd be forever indebted to them for their benevolence in how they imprison us. Imprison you? I'm sorry, has anyone held a gun to your head? Let me remind you again, you are free to go to any country you idolize, such as your home country of Pakistan. But we know why you wouldn't go there. Apart from power blackouts, political instability, sectarian violence, you'd be put in a burqa and made a mother of 10 children where your husband regularly exercises his God-given right to wife beating as sanctioned by the Quran, chapter 4, verse 34. If by imprisonment you mean the West's legal systems and social contracts, those same structures are what allow you the freedom to live your life, travel the world and express your views, unlike many countries where genuine oppression exists. I'll say that again. No one is forcing you to stay. Unlike real colonial subjects, you have the autonomy to leave at any moment. So where exactly is the imprisonment? They thought they could colonize our minds like they colonized our lands. So giving you education, a first world lifestyle, a powerful passport, political freedom to elect the leaders you see fit, and even free speech so you can spew poison against their culture, people, government, and state day in and day out. Is this colonization of mind? Again, if it's so bad, why don't you leave? I hated Pakistan, its lifestyle, its suffocating culture, so I left and never looked back. I moved to the best country in the world and I won't let these self-anointed decolonizers spoil it for the rest of us who are grateful we were given a second chance at life. They didn't know we'd take their gab and garb and use them as tools to free the rest. The very gab and garb she wouldn't have had if her parents hadn't left their third world country for the West. Had her parents stayed in Pakistan, she would have become a mother at 14 and would now be a mother of 14. They didn't know their empire would eventually end by implosion. Ah, that's where the true colors come out. They will not rest until the West falls. The greatest civilization ever created by humanity brought to its knees by these traitors. Other than their hypocrisy, their understanding of the world is so confused that they never talk about, say, Arab colonialism. Is it convenience or simply ignorance? I'll leave that to you. However, let's get back to the point I made at the start. The intellectuals of the Muslim world were realistic and fair enough to admit their shortcomings. Why don't we see that kind of realism in the next generation of intellectuals from the Muslim world? The answer is actually very simple. Because back then, the West didn't apologize for its superiority and dominance. The West was proud of its accomplishments and also forthcoming in admitting its past through genuine academia. That honesty could only be found in Western academia. Muslim academia, on the other hand, has always whitewashed its past cruelty. Maybe this honesty of the West was bound to create the world of self-loathing we see today. Today, Western academics have emboldened these people and serve as catalysts in dismantling Western civilization. Check out this Western academic who says that Hezbollah and Hamas are progressive movements. Similarly, I think, uh, yes, uh, uh, understanding uh, Hamas, Hezbollah as uh, social movements that are progressive, that are on the, on the left, that are part of a global left, is extremely important. That does not stop us from uh, being critical of certain dimensions of um, both movements. It doesn't um, it doesn't stop those of us who are interested in nonviolent politics from raising the question of 
um, uh, uh, of whether there are other options besides violence. Um, so again, uh, a, cr a critical, important engagement. I mean, I certainly think it should be entered into the conversation on the left. I the late Hezbollah chief, Nasrullah, who ordered to kill every homosexual in Lebanon. And these bleeding hard wokey academics are telling us that Hezbollah and Hamas are progressives and it's a leftist movement. Today, Western academics have emboldened these people and serve as catalysts in dismantling Western civilization. This is where the crux of today's problems lies. The West needs to be unapologetic about its past, just like all these other civilizations. We don't have to press the self-annihilation button just because 200 years ago, the West was more successful than the Muslim world in colonizing the world. In fact, I would argue that the West was still miles better than its contemporaries by the standards of the time. The West industrialized the world, and of course, in the process, it benefited greatly. We still have some of the finest universities, hospitals, and schools in Pakistan that were built by the British. Now, I'm not suggesting that the local people did not suffer at the hands of the colonial masters like the British, but I can say that the people of the subcontinent were better off under the British than under their previous colonial masters, the Muslims, and some would say even their today's governments. Every civilization was built on top of dead bodies. We don't have to judge them for how they started because if we did, the whole world would need to be dismantled. We have to judge civilizations by how they treat their people today. The West built technological marvels, took us to the moon and will go beyond and created human rights standards that could never even have been imagined in any other civilization. So to conclude, I do have a solution, albeit not a very popular one, even among my peers. Just as Karl Popper said, we don't have to be tolerant of intolerance because that would create a world of intolerance. Similarly, I propose that free speech should never be extended to those who wish to end free speech. Yes, yes, I'm also a believer in Voltaire's golden quote. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. This quote actually gives us the idea that Voltaire was a free speech absolutist. In reality, this quote is not from Voltaire. It is actually from Evelyn Beatrice Hall in her 1906 book, The Friends of Voltaire, summarizing Voltaire's views. Voltaire himself is said not to be a free speech absolutist. In any case, that quote was said in a different world in a different time. And during that period, the debate was between the Christian church and nationalism. At that time, to be able to speak against the hegemony of the Catholic Church, people like Voltaire advocated for broad free speech protections to challenge the authority of the church. Free speech should be maximized, but not made absolute. Free speech is valuable for criticizing your government, president or prime minister and their policies but it cannot be used to end free speech itself. In fact, this is the argument the Democrats are presenting in this running election in the US. They're saying that the Donald Trump would be the last elected president of the US and after that there will be dictatorship. I don't believe in that conspiracy theory, but if you just look at that argument, would you vote someone in to dismantle democracy? This is exactly what happened in 1930s Germany. They voted Hitler in and then they couldn't get rid of him. So why would you give free speech to those who want to end free speech using free speech? That's a self-defeating notion, just like being tolerant of intolerance. Lastly, I challenge the notion held by free speech absolutists who argue that the only way to counter bad ideas is with better ideas. This is a noble position and it has worked in many Western democracies for nearly 300 years. However, that notion only functions when there is a basic level of shared values and agreement on the rules of discourse. Let's take the American example. The American Founding Fathers debated extensively over the limits of free speech. In fact, when President John Adams feared war with France, he supported the Sedition Act of 1798, which temporarily curtailed free speech despite the First Amendment's protection of it. America could have easily veered toward a more authoritarian state, but leaders like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison worked to restore free speech, both politically and legally. The Sedition Act expired in 1801, and after Jefferson 
Madison's election in 1800, there was a stronger consensus on the centrality of free speech. The key point is that free speech in America was preserved because the nation reached a shared understanding of its importance, even after intense political conflict. Free speech only worked because it was supported across the political spectrum once the initial disagreements were settled. Such an agreement between Westerners and Muslims does not exist. Had founding fathers like Jefferson and Madison also opposed free speech or remained divided, America might not have developed the robust protections we associate with the First Amendment today. The survival of free speech relied on this broad consensus, not just abstract principles. Like, let people who don't respect free speech use free speech and may the better ideas win. And even if that was the case, just because it worked in the past does not mean it's going to work in the future. So what makes you think that Muslims who have different foundational values and do not believe in the concept of the free world will be persuaded by your counter arguments to their totalitarian and anti-Western positions? There won't be, especially when they hold deep-seated animosity towards the West. A non-believer, a non-Muslim. Yeah. We hate him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh -huh. The reason being is because he's upon kufr. So this hate that I have, I'm only doing it in terms of submission to Allah. And with that submission, there's boundaries. The Quran forbids friendship between uh, Muslims and non-Muslims based on the verse in the Quran that do not take Jews and Christians as awliya. Allah prohibited us from taking the Jews and the Christians as close allies. Me supporting a kafir against another Muslim, it's haram. No doubt, it's haram. It's an evil deed, it's an evil sin. Do not take the Jews and the Christians as, as allies. They are in fact allies of one another. And whoever is an ally to them among you, then indeed he is one of them. It is from our religion that we have to hate them for the sake of Allah. Al-adawa, enmity and hatred, meaning we're enemies. Let's not be around the bush, we don't love each other. We don't, we're not on the same page, we are not friends. Does that make sense? We, we are, we are enemies. The kuffar, we hate the kuffar for the sake of Allah, because why? Because they disbelieve in Allah. Loving the Muslims and hating the non-Muslims. Being loyal to the Muslims and not being loyal to the non-Muslims. So keep fighting, fighting the Christians and Jews until they give jizya. So it's compelling them to give jizya. This shows you clearly that it's about uh, forcing people to become Muslim. If you ally with the disbelievers in any wajmal awjah, any way, shape or form, if you ally with the disbelievers, you're a disbeliever. You're a disbeliever because you're allying yourself with a disbelieving nation who believe in kufr and shirk. The disbelievers who are a'da, the enemy is disbelievers. You can continue granting them free speech and the freedom to protest against the very foundations of Western society and try to counter them with your lofty ideals, but it won't work. Just as you believe in free speech, they believe in its absence. How are things going with the pro-Hamas and pro-Hezbollah protesters across the West? Every Western country has tried to handle it as they would handle some Western anarchists, but they have all failed to tackle these pro-Hamas, pro-Hezbollah protesters because they have no respect for your values. They are only using your values against you until the desired result is achieved. Consequently, in the effort to protect their right to free speech, Western societies are often forced to crack down on the counter-protesters. Just look at what's happening in Britain. So no, I think the West needs to get off its high horse of giving free speech to those who want to dismantle the West itself. Bring back treason charges, start cancelling citizenships, stop apologizing for your political and technological superiority, start dealing with this internal threat the same way you deal with Putin's external threat, start legislating and implementing these new laws or else the real far right will control the narrative and will take these steps that I've just mentioned. Why push it until it's too late? I hope you liked today's video. Like, share and subscribe to the channel. You can also support this channel by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Harris Sultan or buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Harris Sultan. If not, then that's okay. Just give it a like and share it with your friends. Until next time, ta-da. If you'd like to support my work, you can become my patron by going to patreon.com forward slash Harris Sultan or you can simply buy me a coffee.